estaba chocando mis cara me sale um, welcome everybody welcome to the dante series conference of the center for italian studies uh, today is March the 9th, and uh, our guest lecturer is Bernardo Picciche, who is uh, a professor at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, where he teaches the humanities and courses on Dante and Boccaccio. Uh, his uh, uh, recent scholarly interests cover a great span of medieval Renaissance and contemporary literature. Uh, he teaches film studies, Mediterranean studies, the connection between law and literature, uh, a topic for which he has um, also edited a volume for uh, Forum Italicum, a special issue on law and literature. And he works also on the interplay amongst different arts. Uh, his recent publications include the mentioned uh, special volume of Forum Italicum, uh, Law and Literature in Italian Culture. Uh, he's uh, recently published an essay on the seventh novella of the sixth day of the Decameron for the American Boccaccio Association. And uh, the topic of today's intervention, a study on Dante's uh, Cato in a volume under the auspices of the Library of Congress. So, uh, welcome, Professor Picciche. Uh, the title of the intervention is Catone in Dante's Purgatory, No Longer a Mystery. Thank you, Giuseppe, for this warm uh, welcoming and for inviting me. I hope that uh, the audience is not going to be disappointed after such a uh, uh, lovely presentation and uh, I will use it to do better, to be a, as a spur to do better. So today I would like to discuss with you the solution of a mystery. Yes, mysteries are in literature too. Uh, scholars uh, can be little Sherlock Holmes to try to find out how come that a writer wrote that thing, since we cannot ask them. And I must tell you that sometimes that I had to speak to contemporary authors and ask things, I realized that oftentimes it's not always so clear why they wrote a specific word. Uh, maybe it was a spur of the moment, maybe it was just an inspiration. All the more so with uh, a writer that died, this year is seven, hundred years of his death, of Dante's death. He died in 1321. The mystery, I, I think I, I solved, at least uh, uh, they accepted uh, the publication of the Library of Congress and the peer reviews didn't reject it. The mystery that I think I solved is why is Cato? where he is. Now we're going to speak of where he is and who is Cato. So why Cato is the guardian of purgatory. It's so much so a mystery that a great scholar who teaches Dante at Princeton has just published four years ago a huge volume on the mystery of Cato reporting the entire sequence of seven centuries of theories about the reasons that led Dante to put Cato where Cato is. And he concludes, this, this color, with the mystery of Cato will be a mystery, will remain a mystery. And I immediately tell you the, the the bulk, then we will flesh out, but I want to tell the bulk. Cato is a pagan, as such, he cannot be, or should not be, among the savaged, among the rescued, among those who will go to heaven after a period in purgatory. And yet he is there. Cato committed suicide 
And you all know what is the punishment for those who take their lives off. They are punished so much that they, are not, not even, they have not even the right to wear their body again after doomsday, even if they are going to hell for good. They have despised the container of the soul, so they will be with their body on their arms, so to speak, as if they were a pair of trousers. They will not be allowed to reuse their body since they despised the body God gave them to the point that they took their lives off. So Cato took his life off. And third, the third reason is not theological, it's political, but we all know at this point that Dante was very <laughs> biased. <laughs> who was with him was righteous, who was against him was not. And uh, he was politically, uh, Dante, a supporter of an alleged idea of a mythicized idea of empire. So he was, uh, in his belief, the empire was the best way of ruling a society. He was a supporter of the Holy Roman Empire. In this, he was a true medieval intellectual, although I should say that footnotes, he was a medieval but with geniality of, as medieval head, because if you look at the program of the European Union uh, and before the European community, it's actually a, for, for certain things, a parallel of the idea of the Holy Roman Empire as Dante and Bartolo di Sasso Ferrato, a great jurist, had. Dante speaks of an empire that guarantees the independence of the identities. And uh, seven centuries later, when the, the, the French, the German, and the Italian uh, got together, oh, what a lovely dog I see there, Virginia. <laughs> when, when, when the French, the German, the Italian, and the Netherlands people got together, they spoke of Europe des Patries. Europe of the uh, mother countries, or fatherlands, if you want. In other words, the principle is the same. To create a Europe that is a huge container to guarantee peace, but not to suffocate the different cultural heritages, the different cultural legacies. The only difference between the structure of the Holy Roman Empire and the European community, nowadays European Union, is that the Holy Roman Empire was imposed by, uh, from above by the usage of the sword, and the com European community, it's freely voted by, uh, well, initially it was imposed by the government, but now it's uh, somehow, somehow freely voted by the Europeans. But the principle is the same. A Europe that is politically united so that there are no domestic wars, at the point there will be domestic wars, civil wars, but in the duly respect of each identity. End of footnote. <laughs> Let's go back to the idea of the empire. And this idea of the empire for Dante is all inspired after the creation of the empire in Rome. Dante, the great myth of the idea of the empire. Cato was an enemy of Julius Caesar. He fought, he died actually, he committed suicide not to become a prisoner of, of uh, uh, Augustus. So he was an enemy of the founders because for Dante, the empire starts not with Augustus, but with Julius Caesar. Historically, it's not correct because uh, Julius Caesar, as you know, renounced, refused to to accept the crown. It was offered three times and three times in deny. The, the, the uh, story goes that uh, he said to the guy who asked 
about the crown three times. He said, I told you you had to ask me four times and I would have accepted. That's a joke. But three times he refused the crown. So to say, to show his allegiance to the Republican idea of Republican Rome. Anyway, for Dante, it, the empire, the monarchy starts with Julius Caesar. And Cato is a great enemy of Julius Caesar. He's a great enemy of the monarchy. He is a, a champion of the old patrician aristocratic Roman Republic. Dante put people in hell for much less. So Cato has three things that don't work well with the idea that he's there in purgatory among the saved and is a guardian of purgatory. So now let's have a little introduction. Uh, I know you, you, you finished uh, 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 the Inferno and, and you came back uh, 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 to, to gaze on stars, okay? The last words of, of uh, Inferno e Tornamo a rivedere le stelle. But after the stars, what Dante sees, as you know, with Virgil, is an island uh, in a form of cone that shows up, magically almost, uh, of course, from the sea. It's an island. Uh, I must tell you that uh, I had a flash once in Naples. I was on the bus on a street in Posillo in Via Manzoni, and the promontory in Naples. And it was uh, rather early in the morning, and I saw an island. An island is called Nisida. They really looked like the mountain of Purgatory. And the form of cone, uh, it was surrounded by clouds at the bottom. So it looked like suspended over the clouds coming out of the sea. And Dante mm, visited Naples, actually. He was for a period in Naples. Uh, for a moment, I said, but that's the purgatory. Who knows? Maybe Dante had <laughs> inspiration for <laughs> that island uh, during his walks in Naples. But that's just my, my imagination. Uh, I am not philological clues to say that. Uh, but it's uh, this island, and uh, they land on this lovely beach, and they find an old gentleman, a venerable character. This old gentleman, a venerable character, is Cato. You have noticed by now that Dante uses uh, striking parallelism. Now, you know that uh, uh, there are cantos, canto six, canto six, canto six in Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradise, canto nine, canto nine, canto nine, that analyze the same topics in, in, in different way by the same topic, the same subject. Again, we have uh, here a guardian of Purgatory, and you uh, uh, create immediately the parallelism with the guardian of hell. You remember Caron, Caronte dagli occhi di Bragia, who is a, an unkempt uh, old uh, man, uh, unpleasant, furious. Whereas Cato is a venerable with a long, a clean white beard with long uh, uh, white hair. Both, however, I have a lot of air, so I don't fit in the category. <laughs> I could not be a guardian if air is a, a, a prerequisite for being a guardian of something, of, of, of hell, of purgatory. But Karen is the anti Okato, is the anti Karen. We are in a world of harmony, of uh, algid. Uh, calm. Everything shows dignity. I'm not going to read what Dante, how Dante describes Cato. We'll do at the end if there is time. I want you to follow me in the discourse. But Cato, it's there, and he's also authoritarian. He's the one who scolds these. Newcomers, the, the souls that come from 
as you know, from the estuary of the river Tiber, where all the dead souls gather, and then they take the little transit boat to go to to the Purgatorio, Purgatory. And uh, these souls uh, seems to be a little bit uh, still uh, 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 too vapid to 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 uh, picnic people, <laughs> and uh, and Kesto is very severe in. Uh, urging them to, to remember that they are not on a picnic trip, uh, they are going to purge their soul. So, so it can be very authoritarian with, with uh, a lot of authority, with a lot of dignity and solemnity, but it can be an authoritarian character. Also, Karen, the guardian of hell, was scolding in a much different style uh, the newcomers. So, Cato has. A saved soul, a crucial role to be guardian of purgatory. It's a very symbolic role. I already uh, shunned the idea that someone formulated that Cato technically is not yet in purgatory because he's on the beach and they have to enter the purgatory and start climbing uh, the mountain. Uh, no. In the moment uh, in which we are out of the infernal tunnel, we are saved. Okay, the blind prison, it's a prison. People cannot stay outside uh, the prison. Okay, the blind prison, you know, is in a synesthesia because a prison cannot be blind, but we understand that it means a place where people cannot see, they cannot see because the not only because it's dark, but they cannot see because they were not able to see their sins when they were uh, alive. Now you know that the souls of hell can remember the past, sometimes regretfully, but never repented. Uh, regretfully for the pleasure of the past, but they never repented. If they were able to repent, they would not be in hell. They can uh, Tell prophecies, which is a very convenient for Dante to say all what he wants to say about people who are still alive, but they cannot see the present as a symbol of their incapability of seeing their scenes when they were alive. You remember, did they do Guido Cavalcanti, a farinata de Uberti? So you remember when the father of uh, Cavalcanti shows up and says, Se per questo cieco carcere vai per altezza d'ingegno, mio figlio, beh, perché non hai teco? Ah, they, they don't speak Italian, that's too, sorry. <laughs> I forgot. But he shows up and uh, he, he doesn't know, know that his son is still alive. Why? Because he cannot see the present. Okay? And it's a symbolic thing. So Cato, it's there, out of the prison. Why is that? Now, the explanation that has been given, righteously in my opinion, thus far, uh, substantially, I repeat, is correct. But there are certain things that uh, uh, do not resonate philologically correct, as philologically correct. They say, Cato is there because he committed suicide in order not to fall as a captive. So he loves so much freedom that uh, he is ready to sacrifice his own life. I have to tell that in Italian and then I translate in English. I didn't learn that in English. Uh, Libertà va cercando che si cara come sa chi per lei vita rifiuta. When Virgil is introducing Dante to be to Cato say, uh, uh, says, Dante is seeking liberty that is so dear as one who sacrificed his own life for it can understand. It's a sort of captatio benevolence, you know, it's a, a, a way to capture the benevolence of Cato and says that Dante is alive and is looking for liberty. The same liberty that only someone was able to commit suicide in order to stay free can evaluate so much as Dante is. So you are one who can understand 
the importance of liberty, Cato, because you committed suicide. And Dante, it's here for liberty. Now, liberty, of course, means liberty from sin, from the sin. Uh, in Italian, the word cattivo, philologically, uh, means, in, uh, in its etymology, means captivus diaboli, prisoner of the devil. Okay, so those who are not saved are prisoners. They are not free. They are slaves of the devil. Those who are outside the hell, they are free. Dante is looking for that freedom. You remember that the comedy started with Dante in the dark forest. So Dante in, in the midst of sin. Now he's trying to get out of that. And Cato has to welcome him as a sort of colleague seeking liberty. So Cato for centuries but even before, uh, way before Dante, since his, his death and, and even during his life, he was considered a champion of the love for freedom, individual freedom and uh, uh, political freedom. Now, the word freedom is very dangerous. It's not due to chance that there is a think tank, which is very conservative, even if they hide that, that is called Cato, <laughs> the Cato Society. But there are uh, old companies behind this think tank. So I don't know how really the debate on environment, for instance, is uh, it's free. Anyway, Cato has been seen way before Dante, Cicero was his father-in-law, has been seen as champion of those who love liberty, a sort of uh, give me liberty of death centuries ahead. Okay political liberty. Let's say that the word liberty is always very dangerous. First of all, it represented the patrician society. So the liberty that he was uh, fighting for was the liberty of uh, an oligarchy. Let us not forget that if you go to England, there is a, I think it's in Cardiff, I don't remember, it's a Liverpool or Cardiff. Uh, there is a monument to a champion of liberty that fought against the king, a Stuart king, in name of liberty. But if we go looking what kind of liberty he wanted, was the liberty to partake in the slave trades, which was a prerogative only of the monarchs. Okay, so this democracy, liberty, they are beautiful words that are used uh, to justify too many things, bombing, conquering, and so on and so forth. So anyway, Cato, by those who love the idea of Cato, the champion of the true liberty, uh, was seen as a, the symbol of all the free people, of all the people who are able to fight with honor and die against a tyrant. It was also, let's say, the bio biographical character now. Cato was a real character. He was the grandson of another important uh, Roman legislator and politician, Cato the Censor. And so he's called Cato the Younger. He was a, a brilliant orator, a member of the Senate, who fought in the period of the Civil War against the heir of Caesars in name of the Republican freedom. Um, it's a character that is ambiguous because if we want uh, to read uh, the partisan uh, uh, biographies, but if you look at the partisans' biographies, they're all written by aristocrats who had all the interest in defending this, the statue quo that Cato uh, wanted to enhance. Then there are other stories in the biography, for instance, there are, it's, a, it's a strange character whose uh, even morality uh, doesn't uh, fit very well in, in, uh, in Dante's theological uh, vision. For instance, he's a guy that uh, he had a beautiful wife and he had a very rich friend who loved Cato's wife. So what he did, he repudiated his wife as an act of courtesy for his friend he allowed his wife to marry his old friend, who was also anagraphically old. And when he died, 
She, the wife, Marcia, who is also men mentioned in the, in the comedy, she inherited all the fortune of the friend and he married her again. <laughs> Strange customs, okay? I don't discuss it. Def definitely, I'm not a moralist. But I was wondering, how can they fit <laughs> in the theological scheme of Dante? But Dante was very good at overlooking <laughs> things that didn't interest him. And in, in, uh, in discussing, like uh, when we write papers, no? <laughs> so papers are an excellent way to show only what we know and to hide what we don't know. Uh, so the the... The character, the, the individual character had, uh, had definitely a, 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 an important stance in Roman history. And after his death, he was surrounded by this aura of heroism. Again, uh, especially in, uh, 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 through the, the pages of those who had sympathy for the Republican oligarchy. Still remains that this person is a pagan. You all remember that Dante, with all the love that he had for Aristotle, Plato, for the great sage of the past, he could not put them in heaven. He created this little valley of the Ethan in order to respect them. Actually, that was a, a very, very uh, innovative uh, uh, creation, which also shows how also enlightened, if we can use this word uh, ante literam, before the time, was uh, the Catholic Church of the time, the Roman Church. Because Dante doesn't uh, do anything against the theology. When theology doesn't uh, speak, he tries to find a justification, he tries to create Nietzsche's, but he was never rebuked under a theological point of view. Dante was unattackable under the theological point of view. Even when he put popes and bishops in hell, no one could censure him because he put the bishops in hell showing facts that theologically are reprobable. Dante was really, even in the period of the uh, Catholic Reformation, when there was a stronghold on, on censorship, uh, unlike Boccaccio and many other authors, Dante remained an important uh, milestone. It was a little bit forgotten in the 18th century, but for aesthetic reason, not for theological reason. So, Dante actually is so foresighted when they speak of Middle Ages that he put some Muslims in the Valley of Ether. And again, if for the pre Christian philosopher, we can have an a justification. They were not Christians because they didn't know about Christ, so it's not their fault. So they deserve a special treatment because they were great souls anyway. But for the Muslims, he put two philosophers, Avicenna and Averroe, and the condottieri who conquered Jerusalem. I wonder how many politicians nowadays would be able to have such longanimity um, uh, towards if Islam it's an enemy towards Muslim. So Dante could have found a nice place for Cato, but he put him among those who were saved. To the point that, uh, as it happened with many also others, Virgil, first of all, uh, some uh, uh, monks, some commentators try to imagine that Cato had a sort of conversion before Christ. So it was, it was said also Virgil. Uh, they try to say him somehow, but there is no possibility to do that. He's a pagan and he died as a pagan. First, X. No, you cannot get into the world of the saved. Yet he's there and he's a guardian. Second, no, you commit a suicide. I mean, there were so many, so many uh, uh, Ethans who died, no, in a noble way, that didn't commit suicide. And he committed suicide. And there is no justification in the Catholic Church for suicide. Now, there was a debate, for instance, uh, the names are St. Thomas, St. Augustine, I don't enter in det into details now, but uh, in which, in some cases, uh, suicide was allowed. The case was... <laughs> 
quite uh, patriarchal mentality for women, for instance, who were uh, uh, at risk of losing their purity. So it was better if they killed themselves. So in that case, they were allowed. Okay, and that was said by some theologians. And they bring the example of the many noble Roman women, Cornelia, first of all, who committed suicide out of shame because they had been assaulted or not to be assaulted. Okay, and so they were heroine also in the Catholic world. But that was then definitely banned by other authors and Thomas. No, suicide is never acceptable. Never. So Dante had really no possibility to, you know, grab some interpretation that could allow him to put a suicide among the saved. So it's the second element of the mystery. And I can tell you, centuries and centuries of debates were about this mystery, and everyone concluded, well, Dante wanted to use the Cato as a symbol, a metaphor of the love that we need to feel for the liberty from the sin. All right, they are right. But still, he could have chosen other symbols. He could have chosen other individuals. Not a, not a Christian guy or a woman who, who did not commit suicide. And let's put aside that he was an enemy of Caesar. So an enemy of the institution that for Dante constituted the only perfect way of ruling. So how come? The answer goes, in my opinion, if uh, to the Roman laws, to the system of Roman laws. You know, the Romans were the great jurists. The system of law that we have in the West, even the system of common law, common law was also in, in, uh, in uh, Roman laws, it was called consuetudo is Roman, and it's a 1,000 year of development. The crown of it is the body of laws organized by the Emperor Justinian in the fifth century. Why I say we have to go to the Roman laws? Because if you remember, let me share screen with this. I mentioned that Dante is introduced to Cato in the line 70 with May it please you to welcome his arrival, since he's in search of liberty which is so dear, as he well knows, who gives his life for it. Liberty, the key word here is liberty. Let's make one step back. What did Dante know about the Roman law? Dante knew the Roman law. And not because he had uh, technically been a student uh, of law. He was not. Petrarch and Boccaccio were, but Dante never attended a regular university. It was a fairy tale that he went to Paris. Uh, maybe, yes, he had discussions with the Dominican theologians who were legislators who lived in Florence, but he technically he didn't study the, the law. But he knew about law. We know that because he wrote texts that are very uh, um, legal, like the monarchy on the monarchy. So he knew very well what was the uh, legal debate at the time and which were the major principle of the law. How did he learn that? Well, I ask you, if you see a teenager with a computer, do you assume that uh, this teenager is uh, a student of uh, engineering or computer sciences? Computers now belong to the alphabetization, to the any literacy. 
of anyone. Well, in the medieval world, the studies of the law, the Roman law, the common law, and the canon law, which is the body of laws issued by the popes, by the, the clergy, the church, were daily bread. And they were part of the upbringing of any intellectual. In a world in which theology, philosophy, and law interplayed, in, they were strictly intertwined, they followed the same principles. And so any intellectual had to study theology and philosophy and consequently law. Besides, Dante was, had been, before going to exile, as you know, an administrator. So he had also a practical experience of the legislative matter. Finally, many legal elements that appear poetically treated in the comedy oftentimes are not really the result of a knowledge of the exact law that Dante is discussing. They were filtered through the literary tradition, through poets, through historians. Why I say that? Because Dante knew only one kind of Roman law, the law that I've just mentioned, the body of law that was organized by the Emperor Justinian. He did not know, for instance, all the laws developed 1,000 years earlier in with the, the so-called laws of the Twelve Tables or the hundreds of, of years of development of changing laws. For instance, he did not know that there was a precise rule in Rome, in ancient Rome, in very ancient Rome, uh, that prescribed the repudium of the wife if she drank. Three were the causes to re repudiate a, a wife, to divorce the wife, but the repudium is unilateral, so, so the husband rejected the wife. If she committed adultery, if she tried to kill the husband, her husband or her children, and if she stole the cellar key or she drank, sivinum bibet. The reasons are clearly in the patriarchal society was the purity of the, the patrilinear uh, uh, inheritance. So the wife had to be sober and not to lose uh, temper or to lose uh, presence. Uh, we don't go into that. But anyway, these laws were in a very archaic Roman law that then vanished through the centuries. Dante did not know them uh, through the studying of the Roman law as he did uh, with the laws of the Corpus Iuris, so the, the body of laws by Justinian. But this law, uh, this habit became a cultural thing, this information passed uh, through poetical texts of Roman poets, whom Dante knew. So the knowledge of, of, of the law for Dante, to summarize, is, if not uh, technically a, the result of a scholarly curriculum, but is the result of that general culture that included the le legal formation in the bringing of the intellectual. There was no intellectual who did not know concepts of the law, like wise concept of theology, concept of philosophy. The methods more or less were the same. Aristotle was behind all. Dante knew the laws through traditional sources of culture, such poetry or historians or anecdotes, and knew that through the daily practice. So Dante knew law. Why it's important that Dante knew law? Because my point is that Dante could write this canto and could put Cato in purgatory because he knew the Roman law. And in particular, he knew one uh, Institute, the Institute of the Emancipation of the Slaves. Dante knew that the slaves in Rome became liberty, which means they automatically 
acquired the Roman citizenship. A slave that was freed became not a second rank, third rank, at least officially Roman. He was a Roman citizen. Actually, Dante know that so well because that is very well expressed in the body of laws by Justinian. Corpus Juris, that's the, the official name, the body of the laws. Had he really been an historian of Roman law, he would have known that uh, Augustus, the very Augustus that he liked so much, had limited this practice. He had limited the amount of liberty, the amount of people who could become, who could become uh, Roman citizen after the this, this slavery time. But he didn't know that. He just knew the law as he could read in the body of laws by Justinian. And the body of laws by Justinian, I, I don't bring the quotation, which are all in Latin, not to burden. Just trust me. And then if you want to know more, I can as well. Uh, the, 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 they say, we, are, we confer citizenship to all the former slaves who become, who are free. There was a, a ritual uh, that's important because, you see, in, it was not the same, for instance, uh, in, in the South where I live, uh, uh, freed slaves were not citizens, <laughs> uh, were pariah somehow, were marginalized anyway. So uh, anyway, the, the, there was a, a ritual that the slave had to wear a particular kind of hat, which is not due to chance, is the same headgear that the French revolutionary symbols adopted. The French, when they did the revolution, they used this hat, the, the, uh, the headgear, the Frisian headgear. Uh, if you saw the Marianne, the symbol of the French revolution as a specific hat, which means I wear it because I'm free, okay? So now you can tell me, Dante knew the Roman law and he knew that the Roman law gave citizenship to all the all those who were freed from slavery. But how come that Cato is there? Well, Cato was a Roman jurist. Even Dante, even uh, Virgil, when he speaks of Cato in his work, he says Dante Jura, the one who gives the laws. So even Virgil in his work had uh, acknowledged Cato as a jurist, okay? And now Cato is there in front of Virgil and in front of Dante. Cato understands that liberty means freedom from the slavery and those who are freed from the slavery becomes automatically citizens of Rome. Again, now we have uh, why? What? How? Okay, in Rome, an emancipated slave became a citizen. Fine. Cato in Rome would have understood perfectly that a, a, a libertus, a freed slave, became automatically a Roman citizen. But uh, what about uh, and so what? Now, you must remember, and you will go also. You will find it in Epis, in uh, Cantos, in Purgatory, and in Heaven. The Dante, or you will do in his uh, political uh, essays, you will read in his political essays, or you read in essays that Dante had read, like Santa, Santa Augustine, who was one of, of the favorite authors of, by Dante, you will read that there was a parallelism between Rome and Heaven. Heaven is called the celestial realm. There is a moment uh, in which Dante speaks of Christ as a Roman. I didn't want to load you with too many quotations or too many PowerPoints. So you, just trust me, you will find that when you read it. There is a moment in quella civita on the Cristo e Romano, that society of which, to which Rome belongs, uh, Christ belongs. So there is a parallelism between what happened in Rome and what happened in heaven. Rome is seen as a representation of heaven on the earth. 
heaven is considered a realm among the clouds. Now, if these two societies are twins, so to speak, their body of laws must be also parallel. So when a Roman slave became citizen because they became free, in the world of the other life, the afterlife, when someone escaped the slavery of sin, automatically acquired the citizenship of heaven. Cato was there as a sort of a custom guardian, so to speak, because he was a Roman jurist. He was a champion of liberty, but above all, he, he knew that Dante is seeking to become citizen of the celestial Rome. Dante is getting emancipation not from a terrestrial slavery. Is getting emancipation from a supernatural slavery, the slavery of the demon of hell. And the moment in which he's free, and he left hell, therefore he was free, the moment he was freed, he applies for the citizenship in the society of the saved. And only a jurist with a Roman background and also quite apropos, a jurist who had been for centuries welcomed and understood as a symbol of liberty could understand that. And I think that with that, the mystery of Cato is solved. Very happy to welcome questions, um, remarks. Uh. Thank you. Yes, in fact, let's, uh, let's give everybody uh, a moment to uh, reconvene and uh, uh, work on their questions if they have them. I would uh, suggest that perhaps you stop the share screen so that we have a, a, a more uh, fluid uh, uh, interaction. Thank you very much. And while you were uh, while you were talking, I have been thinking on the uh, the, the, the cantos of the Inferno that we have been reading so far, and I've been well, first of all, thank you very much for the sorry. I should have that said that first. Thank you very much. It's it's a very thought provoking suggestion, uh, and it's. It makes sense. It is logically right, and also uh, makes me think in this parallelism between heaven and celestial Rome that is affirmed by the figure of Cato. Uh, that the figure of Cato at the entrance of purgatory is also a way of uh, that that Dante the poet, if you will, has uh, to tell Dante the pilgrim that his confusion between human and divine justice that caused so many swooning and so many problems in Inferno uh, is actually reconciliated through the figure of Cato. That once you get to the, the land of the saved, you can understand, you understand immediately how the, the, the juxtaposition of human justice and divine justice is a, a false problem and, and Cato is a symbol for the, the convening of the two, right? What would you like Absolutely. to... Absolutely, actually it is an excellent uh, remark uh, because it allows even more uh, credibility to, the, to Cato to be there. I didn't think of that. I didn't think that uh, at this point Dante is telling us that justice and the sake for liberty liberty seen as spiritual but legal liberty too, is finally uh, combined in, uh, the perfect, uh, in, the, in, in the perfect world of heaven. And Cato goes to represent that. Besides, Cato 
would represent that also in another, uh, in my opinion, in another nuance, uh, as a surprise. Dante oftentimes likes to surprise us. We know that he puts uh, a, a what we consider would consider holy man uh, 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 in the anti uh, hell, now the Pope uh, uh, Celestine, or uh, people we thought would have been uh, in hell, he puts in purgatory or even in heaven, and vice versa. So uh, he likes uh, to remind us that we cannot uh, replace the head of God. Uh, and so that uh, uh, the, 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 the idea of justice and righteousness that we have uh, must not necessarily coincide uh, with the one that God has. And, and Cato, what you mentioned, you made me think, Cato is another one of these uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, of humility that Dante is giving us, uh, putting this mysterious figure and mysterious for for uh, for being a pagan a society an enemy of caesar uh, uh, uh not a mysterious character but a mysterious and the theological lens uh at this place so yes i i i have to reflect more on your uh, we will do even later maybe in italian but it's a very good uh, a very good uh, uh hook for reflection for me Thank you. We, we do have uh, some uh, interventions to start with um, from the chat. Uh, Ashley, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. Also, that I didn't see the full-on connection you were making like during the presentation until after, like of how you could be a slave to your sin and how there's this parallelism of freedom like once you're saved because as you were talking about I thought back to the text like when we first are introduced to the purgatory and how Dante like didn't have color to his skin and then Virgil gives him color back to his skin and just seeing the parallelisms between how dark um, the inferno was compared to the purgatory so I just found that really interesting. Thank you. And you know that Dante has a rhetoric of lights. I mean, in hell, you never have sunlight. Light is either a reflection through the moon, because the moon has not uh, her own light. The moon, uh, uh, it's a reflection of the sun, or it's a light from the fire of the, of the demons, or from, but it has not a real light or its own light. And, and that indicates the lack of godly, uh, of godly presence. So, so whenever you go out of hell, you start having the realm of light. Although you will notice that purgatory, being purgatory, so in the middle between hell and heaven, has also the night. Heaven is pure light, but purgatory has also the night. Why? Because the night is another symbol. It's there to remind us, to remind the pilgrim, as uh, uh, Professor Gazzola said, uh, uh, that the temptation is always there. The possibility of falling is always there uh, during the penitentiary path. I mean, having ac accepted uh, uh, to be sinners, having accepted to embrace the penitentiary path is not enough to give us freedom. Freedom is something we have to conquest day by day because the night is always there. And that is, a, besides, a fantastic uh, political metaphor. Actually, I, I seize the occasion to let you know something that is very little known. But in the, in the United States, among the educated uh, African-American community, because there was also an African-American uh, intellectual bourgeoisie even during slavery, Dante was a hero. There is a book by a colleague of ours so, who used to teach in Pennsylvania and now he left teaching, but it, it's uh, uh, on this uh, 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 popularity of the name Dante that oftentimes is written Dante with a little misspelling in the African-American community because Dante, bring, being the one who spoke of liberty, being the one who is uh, reproducing the path of Moses, no, with, uh, with, uh, in his case, he represents the entire humanity, Israel, and Moses is Virgil, Virgil who cannot see heaven, like uh, 
Moses could not see the Holy Land. So the, 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 the idea of liberty is so connected to the entire divine comedy that in, 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 a, in a society where liberty and slavery were a, a, an harsh debate, uh, Dante became a, a symbol in, in his own way. And uh, you can really check how come there are uh, so many Dante in African-American communities, especially in the past. Thank you. Thank you. We um, are obviously going in the direction of clarifying the position, uh, the author's position of uh, the, the presence of suicides in different uh, places of Inferno and uh, Purgatorio. Is, uh, let, let's have uh, Gabriella take the floor and, and start uh, going in that direction. Thank you. Uh, prima grazie per la uh, presentazione. Um, so could you please clarify with the text how exactly you came to that point where um, Cato is freed from his sin? Um, especially you mentioned, um, you know, he is a pagan and then the whole thing with his wife. Um, you know, these are things that are of questionable virtue. So I was looking to see if you could kind of, um, I guess, prove that to me. <laughs> well, actually, uh, Dante doesn't show us the passages that lead to the salvation of Cato. It, it, that is what generates the shock. Let's call it the shock of having Cato there. That is there. Why? and all these debates going on. Why is that? And so the only explanation was, okay, Dante assumes that God saved Cato, and because Cato represents the hero of liberty in general. But my, my addition is that not uh, how come that Cato was uh, pardoned and so on his life. No, we, give, we, we have to take for granted that happened if Cato is there. It's a... Uh, how can Dante justify such a big thing? And in my opinion, to say that it's just a symbol of liberty is not enough. There were other beautiful symbols of liberty. Uh, in my opinion, it is necessary to link that symbology of liberty and citizenship to the Roman system of law. And the Roman system of laws is acceptable only because we can argue that the Roman system of laws was parallel to the divine system of laws. Only for that, had it been a Babylonian system of laws, some would have said, okay, fine for the Babylonians, but has nothing to do with, with that. But it's all the continuous supposition that are both in prose and in poetry of the strict link between whatever is in heaven and, whatever, and, and what happened in Rome. And so, uh, I, you don't have a moment, I cannot prove, in which we have a God speaking to Cato and say, I pardon you. We, we have to just assume that that happened, otherwise Cato would not be there. But we have to remember that Dante is a poet, so we have to find also the poetical uh, ways that Dante, uh, the poetical sources for Dante. The, uh, because the law, that's important, in this, the law, in, uh, in this text, like in many other texts, like in Boccaccio, for instance, uh, in general, in all medieval and Renaissance texts, in Shakespeare, not only in Italian tradition, but in Shakespeare, in Cervantes for the Spanish, Spanish tradition, the law is fundamental as a source, such important, so important as a theology, as mythology, okay, as a, a, a literature. It shows up uh, like a... a a, a, a river, no, a, a, in Italy we have a region that is famous for rivers that uh, uh, appear and disappear, uh, Carsican rivers are called. So the law can appear in literature in two ways, either overtly expressed as a text that is de tackling with a legal topic, imagine the Merchant of Venice, or simply as a hidden source. And in this case, it is a hidden source. One has to know the Roman law, which uh, in my case, the reason I was fortunate enough to know that because I have a law degree and in Italy law means to study for the first year Roman law. 
For one year, we only study Roman law, history of Roman law, and institutional Roman law. And I remember my professor in 1992, the first year, he said, what you are studying now was institutions of Roman law is exactly what your colleagues in Byzantium were studying 1,400 years ago. <laughs> which I didn't like much at that time. So, but then we had that. So, for the first year, we just had that Roman law, Roman law. Then I studied literature, but and so I could I could match the two. Okay. So to respond to your question, a clue we don't have. The clue is Dante itself, himself, who says he's there, and Rebus Sixtanti will things stay there. We have just to find out how he can. Uh, scaffold and motivate such a daring choice. And Thank the response you. is only legal, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Virginia and then to Anastasia and Anna, who has a comment. Uh, and these questions revolve around basically the same the same concept uh, the, but let's start let's start with Virginia if you don't mind um okay uh, I found it interesting that Cato was a suicide but he was still in purgatory I wanted to know if there were others in purgatory like him and where the line is drawn whether where God draws the line or I think more where Dante draws the line. Yeah, that is what creates the conundrum, the shock, because no one, there are no other examples uh, in Purgatory, let alone in heaven. So Dante is strict. That Dante created a, a, a whole uh, forest of the suicides. And uh, not only he, but Catholic theology reject suicide. There is no justification for suicide. So uh, that is a shock. How come the Dante ventured, not to say dared, to place a suicide in that position? You won't find any, because at that point, I think it would have really been excommunicated. <laughs> so, so, and uh, that shows, however, also how uh, subtle and uh, how open-minded was the, uh, I could say, I say Catholic because today we have Catholic and uh, Reformed churches, but back then I could have said simply Christian, at least <laughs> Roman, uh, not, not Orthodox uh, uh, Christian, but in Europe we're all, in Western Europe we're all Catholic. So, but uh, let's call Catholic for convenience. How open-minded were the uh, Catholic hierarchy? They, they didn't uh, comment, they didn't uh, ostracize Dante, they didn't censure him for that. But we must also know that uh, the Catholic intellectuals recommended to study the classics. They even thought that Cicero was perfect as a Christian author. The, the canon law owes so much, and the theology of St. Thomas, which is the theology used by Dante, owes so much to the classics and to the law and to the Arabic classics, Avicenna Verre, because Dante knew Aristotle thank to the translation and the commentaries made by Arabic authors, who are the ones he puts in the Valley of the Ethan. So he has gratitude. Exactly, the, we have the book that Dante uh, new was the, the it's called the Codex Alexandrinum, and it, Alexandrinum and it's in uh, in Rome in the Vatican Library. It was a code when the book were copied were not called were called codes. It was uh, uh, before the invention of a uh, print, and there was a book uh, that was copied written in Alexandria of Egypt of Aristotle. So the Aristotle that Dante knew. And the, and the Aristotle that, apart of what he learned through St. Thomas, is this codex that is in the Vatican. Thank you. Uh, let's proceed to, um, to Anastasia, who, in fact, has a, makes a very interesting point and reminds us 
that uh, not only Pierre de Levigne and uh, Cato are suicides scattered in different locations, but there is a there's a third uh, Seneca, Lucius Aeneas Seneca, who is as interesting as uh, Cato because Seneca was another uh, philosopher who committed suicide for political reasons, because he, as we know, had been accused of being part of the conspiracy to assassinate the Emperor Nero. Um, now, it's interesting because it, this mention brings us the juxtaposition of Cato versus Brutus and Cassio, who and Cassius, who uh, are, as we know, in the possible, in the worst possible position in uh, in hell, and uh, they were punished, so punished because they were betrayer of the empire, right? So, philo philosophically and politically, Brutus and Cassius represent a contradiction as much as it is, or it could be, a contradiction to have. Uh, Cato, where he is. So please, Anastasia. Oh, yes, that was pretty much my question. Um, Seneca's suicide always stood up to me, stood out to me historically. So I was always wondering, what is it for Dante that maybe redeemed him in a way that he wasn't put in the forest of the suicides? Maybe there is a, a parallel between what redeems Cato and what redeems Seneca, because I don't know, because of maybe political reasons for their suicide. It's a very, very interesting question, and I, I don't think I have a, a, an answer, except I can create one now. I can think with you. So let's start saying, first of all, the one of Seneca was not a real suicide. He was forced to cut his veins. It was a sort of condemnation, okay? It was a death condemnation from Nero. So he had to do that. So uh, if he, uh, let's say he did it manually, but uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, that the order came from the palace. Anyway, manually too, legally, can represent a suicide. Uh, what is the admiration that Dante has for Seneca? After all, Seneca uh, was in that moment an antagonist of the emperor, but Dante was lucid enough to distinguish among the emperors. <laughs> The empire for him is the Augustan empire with the myth that he had. Definitely, like Dante believes in the papacy, but it's not the Pope Boniface VIII. So let's say the Nero for Dante was sort of equivalent of these negative uh, rulers or negative popes. But in my opinion, but I repeat, I didn't go to a library to respond to this question. And I'm used to, to respond to questions uh, when I, I have some philological evidence. My opinion, the fact that Dante has so much sympathy for Seneca is because they both, Seneca wrote a eulogy of Cato. So they have a Cato in common, <laughs> the love for Cato. And I always mention that Dante is very partisan. The friend of my friends are my friends. <laughs> so uh, they have this idea of one of the most famous, in fact, uh, representation of Cato that also inspired Dante. One is Lucan and one is Dante. Lucan in the Farsalia, the description of Cato actually is that it shows in the Farsalia by Lucan, another uh, uh, poet actually was a contemporary of Seneca and a relative of Seneca uh, at the court of uh, Nero. Uh, they all praised Cato, but why also they were praising Cato in Nero's time? Because it was a, to show what a bad emperor was Nero and therefore to I uh, have a, a regret uh, for uh, not having, for losing, for having lost the golden age of Republican Rome. I might think that this is uh, uh, the element that, uh, uh, the link that unites Dante to Seneca. Okay, besides technically, we, we know that the one, uh, uh, the death of Seneca was a condemnation to death inflicted by the Emperor uh, Nero. I may be wrong, however. Very good question. I will uh, inquire better. <laughs> Very good question. Um, then we have uh, Anna, who 
poses uh, the same question in, in her comments. She says suicide. I, I still don't understand why some suicide, I believe she says, uh, can be uh, can be excused and some is not. Um, but I, I would understand that. That's why I'm just trying to add pieces. Thus far, they said because he's he, he transcends the fact that he committed suicide. He becomes the symbol of the love of liberty. And I added to flesh up, to add more substance to that symbolism with a legal uh, addition. But it, I repeat, it's just that we are trying to give an explanation for such a monstrum, so a monstrous things, so such a, an injustice, if you want, that Dante deliberately commits. How come the Dante, it is very logical, that uh, doesn't uh, put any single word out of place. How come that he does something like that? Actually, with the occasion, I have to tell you another problem, but to study this thing took me 10, 15 years. I will never solve the other problems and um, I'm tired. But the other problems with Dante is another mystery that I have. And I'll tell you, you will see. When uh, Virgil is in purgatory, and they meet uh, the Roman poet Statius. Statius says something that sounds a blasphemy to me. And I always wondered how come. It seems that uh, the entire fantastic uh, theological uh, structure, this cathedral built by Dante, collapses. But I don't dare to think that. I asked everyone. I asked stars of Dante scholarship in Italy, in England, and they all gave the same example. It's an hyperbole. It's hyperbolic. Da, da, da. Or poetry is a form of prayer. That's the nicest answer that I had. That I didn't have it from a star, actually. I had it from a student. Poetry is the highest form of prayer. But there is a moment in which Statius says, in my opinion, a blasphemy. He says, I would spend another year in purgatory if I could meet Virgil. It's a great compliment to poetry. It's a great compliment to Virgil, e equal to the one that Cavalcanti receives uh, through the words of his father. If uh, you are in this blind prison, uh, thanks to the height of your brain, where is my son? Okay, so, so Dante uh, praises his friend Cavalcanti, creates this monument of admiration in the, with the words of Statius, but theologically, that is another mystery for me. Come on, the entire purgatory is the joy that these people have to go through pains, which are no pains, because for them it's a process of purification. I like to compare that to the makeup uh, uh, of people who spend hours in front of the mirror and just for the joy of being then, all you can see people who undergo plastic surgery, you know? It's not, pain, it's not uh, painless plastic surgery, but it's the joy of having a better result later. So it's a great thing to have plastic surgery. So purgatory is going to be like that. So all things they do is the joy of, the haste actually of, of, of reaching God as soon as possible. And Statius, who is there about to reach God because the, the mountain is trembling, which means that someone is finally flying to heaven, says, oh, heaven can wait. If I could see Virgil, a poet, a very human, terrestrial thing. Yes, the explanation that poetry is a form of prayer is a nice explanation, but it doesn't convince me. Forgive me, now that we are in confidence, I can tell you an example that come to me. It's like a father who is in prison, a family a guy who is in prison, has been in prison for 30 years, and all the time in prison says, I want to see my wife and children, my wife and children, my wife, finally gets up of prison. He, he gets a car, and when he sees his house, he deviates left to the prophet. The comparison can sound a little prosaic, but it's that. Come on, you've spoken of your wife and your children all your time for 30 years, and now they are reaching them, you don't even stop to buy presents to your, to your children and wife. You go to the prophet. It's the same thing. The souls in purgatory have all, I mean, all purgatory is to teach us that we have to forget all the inanities of the past. Cato imparts a good lesson 
to Virgil and Dante when uh, Marcia is mentioned and he says, I loved Marcia, his wife, very much. And I told you, <laughs> but now you cannot mention Marcia to move me. She's far away now for me. She's in the Valley of the Ethans. Cato will go on the contrary. He will be rescued. Dante tells that he's be rescued. There are passages which he says that he will go to heaven. It's not only, it's, I can add it to what Gabriel asked. There are lines. Uh, I can pick it up if you like. Where, uh, in the same canto first, where Cato make us understand that he's going to be among the heavens. So he has been saved. So it's clear there. So we don't know uh, uh, why, <laughs> but he says that. So, and that is a mystery of Stasia. So there are parts of Dante that I still don't know how to solve. But I can solve what Gabriella Dattolo asks. Very interesting. I had also a question about Dante's allusion to Venus. This I, I can answer. Uh, we can all answer. Dante remains a poet. And you know that his work must be read also, if not foremost, as a poetical text. So Dante called God Jupiter, Jove. He intertwines, intermingles, plays or interplays with the pagan mythology. But that are poetical allegories. It's not blasphemous when he called God Job or when he mentioned continuously things that don't belong to a strict theological text. Why? Because otherwise he would write the Summa Theologica like St. Thomas did. He's a poet. Remember, the literature is a lie that uh, reveals the truth. There was a great uh, filmmaker who was called the professor for how philologically correct he was in his research, Francesco Rosi, to the point that many movies have uh, elements of documentaries. But he said, I would trade the truth for a nice picture. This is art. That does not confuse the two disciplines. Dante is putting uh, theology in poetry, but he remains a poet. He does uh, practically the same job that uh, Lucretius did. Lucretius is the one who says, my job of a poet is to give you the philosophy in poetical form. Actually, he says, since the philosophy he was giving us was a bitter one, a philosophy of the world without gods, therefore without hopes. That's why probably Lucretius committed suicide, he too. He says, I am, the role of a poet is to be like a doctor who puts honey on the brim of a cup so that the child can drink the bitter medicine. So the bitter medicine is the content of the rerum natura and the honey, it's the sweet things made by poetry in making us digest the bitter medicine. Dante has a nice medicine. That's why it's called comedy because it starts bitterly like a tragedy and ends well. Comedia, no? That's the Aristotelian difference between tragedy and comedy. A tragedy is something that starts well, a party, a wedding, and then everyone dies. And then a comedy is the contrary. There is always a trouble. There is always a, a losing someone at sea, pirates, and then finally everything goes well. That's why comedia, that's why it's a comedy. It tends well. So the medicine that Dante gives us is not bitter. But still, what he does, he makes the theology and the philosophy of his authors, of his, there is a nice book about Diodolinda Baroline, Dante's poets, but also we have to analyze Dante's intellectual. He conveys all what he learned in a poetical form to make it pleasant. If we remember Dante, is not for his theological truth because Dante doesn't invent much. All this idea, uh, Dante is an excellent way to understand the Catholic theology, the free will, uh, the, the idea of the growth of the soul, all these things for those who believe, of course, I, I'm told you I don't have such a luck, but for those who believe, they're, they're clearly explained by Dante. But he doesn't invent. Also the laws that he says, they were there. He transformed them in poetry, he transformed law, the Roman law, in poetry, because the sounds 
libertà va cercando che si cara come sa chi per lei vita rifiuta first of all it's a beautiful poetical line thank you bernardo thank you professor picicche uh, i'm afraid that our time is up if you are available i'm sure that uh, we'll have you back Uh, and thank you very much for your presence, thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to our special guest, Bernardo Picicchi. Thank you to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.